Welcome to NTD Evening News. Our top story tonight, Luigi Mangioni, the suspect arrested in the CEO murder case, has been denied bail in Pennsylvania. That's after he was charged with murder in the fatal shooting of United Healthcare's chief executive Brian Thompson. Chris Spears brings us the updates as the high profile case moves in and out of court. Firefighters in California are battling a massive brush fire in Malibu. The blaze has forced thousands of residents and students in the area to evacuate. Christina Corona reports from Los Angeles. The Biden administration responds to the new government in Syria while Israeli forces enter the buffer zone within the country. We bring you the latest in the Middle East conflicts. Two of President-elect Trump's New York cases may not go away for good. That's despite his federal criminal cases being dismissed. Jack Bradley is in West Palm Beach. Trump's cabinet picks Tulsi Gabbard, Kash Patel and Pete Hegseth receive broad support from Senate Republicans, while Democrats vow to oppose their confirmation. Luis Martinez brings us more from Capitol Hill. This is NTD Evening News, live from our global headquarters in New York City. Here's Tiffany Meyer. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. Bail denied to Luigi Mangioni, the detainee suspected of killing United Healthcare's chief executive. He refused extradition to New York after entering a Pennsylvania courtroom in an uproarious fashion. Mangioni faces five charges in Manhattan, including murder. Here's NTD's Chris Beers with the update. The judge gave Pennsylvania's Blair County District Attorney Peter Weeks says Luigi Mangioni, the suspect in the killing of United Healthcare CEO Brian Thompson, requested bail but was denied. Mangioni's local defense attorney, Thomas Dickey, cited his client's clean record. He also said his client could wear a tracking bracelet if granted bail. Mangioni is fighting extradition to New York where he faces murder charges. New York Governor Kathy Hochul plans to submit a warrant for his extradition, and Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg's office said it will seek that warrant. Mangione struggled with police and shouted something mostly unintelligible on his way into the Pennsylvania courthouse. The Associated Press reported that as this unfolded, Mangione said the words, insult to the intelligence of the American people, though it's not clear what he said before or after that. An employee at a McDonald's in Altoona, Pennsylvania, identified the 26-year-old based on publicly available photos and tipped off local police. Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro thanked that person at a press conference. Pennsylvania resident saw something early this morning at McDonald's and said something to our local police. Altoona authorities described the events leading to Mangione's capture. Altoona police officers received a call of a suspicious male at a local restaurant. When officers arrived, they made contact with the male who had a face mask on. Uh, that male was asked to remove his face mask, and officers immediately recognized him as a suspect in the New York City shooting. Governor Shapiro also thanked Officer Tyler Fry, who encountered and recognized Mangione. Officer Fry is about six months into his time serving his fellow people here in Pennsylvania, and he acted swiftly, he acted with smarts, and he acted with calm. It feels good to get a guy like that off the street, uh, especially starting my career this way. It's, it feels great. We knew that was our guy, but he was very, uh, he was very cooperative with us, didn't really give us too many issues. Uh, once we found out his identity, we, we took it from there. Mangione is an Ivy League grad and the 2016 valedictorian of a Baltimore prep school. He's the grandson of a wealthy real estate developer and the cousin of current Maryland State Senator Nino Mangione. Chris Beers, NTD News. Firefighters in California continue to battle a wildfire in Malibu, with officials saying their suppression efforts are far from over. The blaze near Pepperdine University has prompted thousands of evacuations as strong Santa Ana winds fuel dangerous fire conditions. Entity's Christina Corona tells us more. 
The Franklin Fire was first reported around 10.45 p.m. Monday near Malibu Canyon Road, just north of Pacific Coast Highway. As of Tuesday evening, the blaze has grown to over 2,700 acres, with 700 firefighting personnel assigned to the Malibu area. Officials gave an update Tuesday morning addressing the blaze. Units reported five acres of heavy brush burning and being spread by strong Santa Ana winds. The fire is currently estimated at over 2,200 acres and we have 700 firefighting personnel assigned. Because of the great work of the firefighters that were on scene, we have only a minimal number of homes destroyed. The exact number of homes destroyed remains unknown. Waterworks District 29 and the Department of Public Works have urged residents outside the immediate fire area to turn off their sprinklers to conserve water. Fire Chief Anthony Maroney stated that officials are closely monitoring water pressure. We do have personnel on scene. That water should be used for firefighting and not to sprinkle or, or um, irrigate your lawns and it's going to be of little use from starting from having a brush fire start near your home. The Sheriff's Department has over 150 personnel, including Malibu Search and Rescue, that are assisting with this fire incident. There are currently 18 operations that include evacuations, road closures, and security patrols. Evacuation orders were quickly issued for multiple neighborhoods, including areas east of Malibu Canyon Road, south of Puma Road, and the Sarah Retreat community. Additional orders were later extended from Tuna Canyon to Puerco Canyon. Approximately 18,000 people and 8,100 structures in the affected area. Of the 8,100 structures, 2,043 structures are under evacuation orders and 6,046 are under evacuation warnings. One Malibu resident shared that she immediately woke her family up to evacuate. After that, I must have had like 30 minutes to run around and um, try to get the horses. And we didn't know what we were going to do. Like, we could not leave them in the barn. Thank God we didn't leave them in the barn because the barn burned down. Pepperdine University issued a shelter-in-place order for approximately 800 students, but later lifted it. One student shared that the power went out in her campus residence hall, and she immediately suspected it was because of the fire, given the area's red flag warning conditions. I just packed a bag, and as soon as things start to get, started to get really stressful, I made my way down to my shelter-in-place order, which is the library. And students here were very stressed because of finals, but also because we look out the window and you know, the sky is red. A temporary evacuation center has been set up at the Palisades Recreation Center. No serious injuries or fatalities have been reported. The current red flag warning due to strong winds and low humidity remains in effect through Wednesday evening. The cause of the fire is still under investigation. Christina Corona, NTD News. The U.S. is responding to the formation of the new transition government in Syria. This while Israel launches widespread strikes on the country. The rebel group that toppled President Bashir al-Assad's regime in Syria vowed to pursue Assad officials who were involved in the torture of Syrians. The group said their transition government will publish a list of officials involved in war crimes and extradite them back to Syria. And the rebel group appointed a close ally as caretaker prime minister of the government until March. The U.S. has designated the group, known as HTS, as a foreign terrorist organization since 2012. But the Biden administration said Tuesday it will recognize and support a new Syrian government. That is, as long as the leadership renounces terrorism, destroys chemical weapons stockpiles, and protects the rights of minorities and women. The State Department has not ruled out talks with the main Syrian rebel group. The Biden administration continues to target ISIS in Syria to prevent that terror group from reemerging as an international threat. The White House said that American troops will remain in the country as part of the counterterrorism mission. Meanwhile, Israeli forces launched airstrikes at Syrian army bases Tuesday. Officials said they aimed to keep weapons from falling into hostile hands. Israeli ground troops also moved into a UN-monitored buffer zone between Syria and the Golan Heights. 
We have no intention of interfering in Syria's internal affairs. However, we do intend to do what is necessary for our security. As such, I approve the Air Force bombing of strategic military capabilities left by the Syrian military so that they will not fall into the hands of the jihadists. The defense minister has ordered Israeli forces to create a sterile defense zone in southern Syria. Israel calls the incursion a temporary measure to ensure border security and denied moving beyond the buffer zone. But Syrian sources said Israeli forces are now only within 15 miles of the capital city of Damascus. And Netanyahu vowed today to refute corruption charges against him, calling the allegations baseless. Taking the stand in his long-running trial, Netanyahu made history as the first sitting Israeli leader to testify as a criminal defendant in court. Allegations include accepting cigars and champagne from a Hollywood producer. Prosecutors allege he exchanged favors for personal and business interests. Netanyahu is also accused of promoting regulations benefiting media moguls. In return, they allegedly provided favorable coverage of his family. Netanyahu denies wrongdoing, calling the charges a biased witch hunt. He blames a hostile media and a prejudiced legal system. Protesters gathered outside the Tel Aviv courthouse divided over Netanyahu. He faces a fraud, breach of trust and bribery charges in three cases. The New York Attorney General's office will not drop its civil fraud case against President-elect Trump. And on the business records case, the Manhattan District Attorney just said he is not dismissing that conviction. NTD's Jack Bradley joins us live now from West Palm Beach, Florida. Good evening, Jack. What is the latest on these cases? Good evening, Tiffany. Well, in the civil fraud case, the attorney general said that uh, there's no means for dismissal here. This comes after Jack Smith dropped both criminal cases uh, against Trump. And th they're saying here that this is a civil case, not a criminal case. And so they argue that they're irrelevant and that it would not impact Trump's official duties. A judge found Trump guilty in this case of inflating his assets for tax benefits. He ordered Trump and the defendants to pay over $460 million. And this number keeps growing with interest while they appealed. It's now nearly $500 million. And in the campaign finance case in New York, a judge is considering throwing out the sentencing, which has been postponed indefinitely. Manhattan po prosecutors today are opposing this. They said in a filing that the dismissing this conviction would be unjustified, but they would agree to put the case on hold to avoid any interference with his duties. Tiffany. And Jack, Trump recently nominated Attorney Harmie Dillon as Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights. Tell us about his latest appointments. Right. So Dylan has a proven record of uh, she's a, a litigator as well as standing up for civil rights. He said on Truth Social about her um, that Dylan has taken on big tech for censoring free speech and represented religious people who were prevented from praying together during covid. Dylan thanked Trump, calling the role a lifelong dream and pledging to protect civil rights. Trump also announced yesterday uh, Mark Palometta, uh, Pauletta, that as general counsel for the Office of Management and Budget, and Pauletta will lead efforts to streamline government spending. And just moments ago, Trump just tapped Jacob Helberg to be the next undersecretary of state for economic growth, energy and environment, and also Andrew Ferguson to be the next chair of the Federal Trade Commission. And Trump has said that Ferguson has a record of standing up against big tech censorship, as well as protecting freedom of speech. Tiffany. And Jack Trump also posted on social media calling Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau the governor of the great state of Canada. What's behind this? That's right. So this is after Trudeau said in an interview that any further tariffs on Canada from the U.S., which Trump intends to do, uh, would hurt Canada and also increase prices on the U.S. Uh, citizens here. Uh, Trump said in a recent interview with NBC that the U.S. is already subsidizing Canada and Mexico and that this would level the playing field. Take a look. We're subsidizing Canada to the tune of over $100 billion a year. We're subsidizing Mexico for almost $300 billion. We shouldn't be subsidizing. Why are we subsidizing these countries? If we're going to subsidize them, let them become a state.
Now, Trump met with Trudeau at Mar-a-Lago just a little over a week ago, and this comes after Trump announced that he would impose a 25 percent tariff on Canada, Mexico, as well as a 10 percent extra tariff on top of all of Chinese goods. Uh, and that's due to the illegal immigration as well as the fentanyl mostly coming from China. Now, as, as far as this goes, there's right now a caravan coming through Mexico that's apparently headed to the U.S. southern border, uh, making its way there now, apparently before Trump takes office in January. Tiffany, back to you. All right, Jack, thanks for those updates. President-elect Trump's nominees are meeting with senators this week in preparation for next year's confirmation process. Senate Republicans have shown their support for Trump's selections. Our Washington correspondent, Luis Martinez, has more on the story. President-elect Donald Trump's most embattled nominees visited Capitol Hill this week. Peter Hexeth, Trump's pick for Secretary of Defense, met for a second time with Senator Joni Ernst from Iowa. And after this second meeting, it seems that the National Guard officer has changed Senator Ernst's mind. I am supporting him through this process, and I'll just refer you back to the, the statement. Is that a yes? You could, you could change your mind? It was a very productive meeting, though. I, I think we're... We're just moving through the process. But he does respect that I'm taking the time. Grateful uh, that she said she's going to support us through that process. And that's what we talked about. And uh, it's been substantive and meaningful. Tulsi Gabbard, Trump's pick for director of national intelligence, met with Senators Graham, Rounds, and Lankford. Uh, Gabbard has come under fire for a trip she made to Syria back in 2017. Tulsi Gabbard has defended her foreign policy views in private meetings with Republican senators and has since mustered their support. But, you know, she'll be serving at Trump. We'll see how the hearing goes. I like her. She's going to get back with me. We had a very good meeting. And I'm inclined. Well, uh, my own views and, and uh, experiences have been shaped by my multiple deployments and seeing firsthand the cost of war uh, and the threat of Islamist terrorism. Uh, it's one of the many reasons why I appreciate President Trump's leadership. Kash Patel, Trump's pick for FBI director, has had meetings with Senators John Cornyn, Mark Wayne Mullen, with Mike Lee and Chuck Grassley. The reactions from these Republican senators have been of support. It was good. Great. Uh, Cash is, you know, doing what he needs to do, get on the Hill, earn the vote of, uh, of, the, of uh, senators. And as I've said before, the game up here is not to put yeses, it's to keep no's off the board. And uh, Cash is going to be able to deliver. We'll, we'll be get him confirmed. I'm really confident about that. We still don't know what uh, Director Ray's plans are, but um, eventually I assume that uh, Mr. Patel will be confirmed as the next FBI director. Trump's nominees can only afford to lose three Republican senators in the confirmation process. And in that case, a 50-50 vote would have to be broken by uh, Vice President J.D. Vance. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. Senator John Thune said today that Senator Mitch McConnell was fine after suffering a fall at the U.S. Capitol. Mitch McConnell left a Senate lunch today with a cut on his face. He was accompanied by Senator John Barrasso as medical help arrived. McConnell did not attend the Senate GOP press conference. McConnell is due to step down as the leader of the party's chamber next year. However, he plans to serve the remaining two years of his term as a senator. This is despite health issues in recent years. Coming up, mass deportation, the topic of a Senate hearing Tuesday. A mother shares her tragic story of how an illegal immigrant murdered her daughter. For Human Rights Day, Secretary of State Antony Blinken honors human rights defenders. And President Biden issues a proclamation for the day, 75 years after the first one by President Harry Truman. Jason Blair has the highlights from Blinken's remarks. And California could be the first state to require a warning label on social media. The proposal is for a 90-second warning about mental health when using social media sites. David Lamb reports from the Bay Area after the break. Welcome back. I'm Tiffany Meyer, a Senate hearing on mass deportation. Lawmakers give their fiery opinions on President-elect Trump's upcoming plans. Here's the story. I will launch the largest deportation program in American history. The Senate held a hearing Tuesday on mass deportations. Patty Morin shares the tragic story of how an illegal immigrant allegedly murdered her daughter. She was 
um, beaten so badly that her body was blanketed in bruises, that she was strangled, that she was raped, and that she was stuffed into a drain pipe. While holding up a picture of her daughter, Morin says lawmakers should prioritize the safety of Americans. She says in Maryland, a so-called sanctuary state, crime has increased by 850 percent. We have Americans that are dying every day. And law enforcement don't want to give you the true numbers because they don't want the public to panic. Aaron Reichlin Melnick, senior fellow at the American Immigration Council, says only a small percentage of the 13 million illegal immigrants commit crimes. They are farm workers, meat packers, cooks, waiters, construction workers, factory workers, delivery people, home health aides, nurses, teachers, artists, writers, musicians, entrepreneurs. Melnick says over 90 percent have no criminal record and are in constant fear of deportation. He says many of them should be given a path to citizenship. The last thing we want to do is give amnesty to people here now because we'll be overrun. Republican Senator Lindsey Graham supports deportation. He says if we do not have outflow, the inflow will continue. How many people want to come to America that are non-criminals? Probably hundreds of millions, and I understand why it's a great country. Senator Josh Halley getting into a testy exchange with the Immigration Council's Aaron Reichlin Melnick. Why would you want to drive down the wages of millions of working Americans who can't get those jobs in construction, agriculture, and hospitality because illegal immigrants are getting them? And suppressing wages in the meantime, why would you want to do that? Well, if you've been here for my initial testimony, you know I don't want to oh, listen. I, I read your testimony word for word, and I've been watching it, and I know what the answer is. You don't actually care. President elect Trump will be sworn in on January 20th, 2025. The same day, He's vowed to initiate what he's called the largest deportation operation in American history. Trump says he is willing to work with Democrats on a plan for Dreamers. And New York City Mayor Eric Adams prepares to meet with Trump's border czar nominee while trying to change the city's sanctuary city law. Hear what political strategists on both sides of the aisle have to say about it on NTD's Capitol Report with Steve Lance at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Human Rights Day is observed every year on December 10th. Secretary of State Antony Blinken delivers remarks at a ceremony honoring human rights defenders. And President Biden shares a proclamation. NDD correspondent Jason Blair brings us more. Secretary of State Antony Blinken delivered remarks at an awards ceremony in Washington, D.C. in honor of Human Rights Day and those who work to protect them. Everyone, everywhere, is entitled to these rights including people in the United States. And it's because we know that a world where human rights are respected is profoundly in our interest. Blinken presented awards to eight people for their work in defending human rights. I can't think of a better way to celebrate Human Rights Day than by honoring these truly remarkable individuals. It's um, easy to engage in hyperbole about just about anything these days, but this is the real thing. President Joe Biden released a proclamation. He said on Human Rights Day and during Human Rights Week, we recommit to upholding the equal and inalienable rights of all people. America was founded on an idea that every person is created equal and deserves to be treated equally throughout their lives. Human Rights Day was created by the UN in 1948 after World War II. It was formed in response to the war's atrocities, which included the Holocaust. The intent was to establish a common standard of human rights for all nations. And I also caught up with some congressmen for some comments on human rights. One rep specifically called out the Chinese Communist Party for their ongoing abuses. What we've witnessed in Xinjiang province uh, is, is really underscores why uh, we need moral clarity in the competition with China. Uh, and what has happened with the Uyghurs is, uh, is exhibit A of the immorality of uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party. We need to continue to highlight that. You know, America hasn't always got everything perfect, but we always try to. We always look in the mirror, look reflectively and say, where can we do things better? And that's an example that I think we set better than anybody else. The first Human Rights Day was formally observed in 1950, but the U.S. first observed it in 1949 with a proclamation by President Harry Truman. 
Reporting in Washington, D.C., Jason Blair, NTD News. California could be the first state to require mental health warnings on social media. NTD's David Lamb reports. California's Attorney General Rob Bonta and Assemblywoman Rebecca Bauer Cahan propose a new social media bill this week. They say it would provide information about the risks of social media to young people. The bill would require the display of a 90-second warning to users of all ages on their first use of a platform. After that, it would be displayed at least once a week. People in California shared their thoughts with NTD. I think at the end of the day, it's the right for the people to know that what their child is consuming and if there is a restriction put or if there is a label put, uh, it will always be a good step for their mental health. So that comes before any business or any uh, profits because mental health is more important than that. The label has been compared to seatbelt laws and alcohol warning labels. California also has a Proposition 65 label warning about certain chemicals and packages or products. I think it's a good idea. Yeah, because it is true. What I read, or what I see on kids that spend a lot of time on social media, they are more like active or more restless. The VP of Technology Policy at Chamber of Progress said that the warning label ignores the reality that most teens view social media as an important outlet for social connection. According to Attorney General Rob Botts' office, adolescents who spend more than three hours per day on social media face double the risk of poor mental health outcomes, including symptoms of depression and anxiety. If it's a warning, I don't see it being a affecting your first amendments. You don't have to heed the warning, but it's just a, a general reminder. Earlier this year, the U.S. Surgeon General called on Congress to require a Surgeon General's warning on social media platforms. David Lamb, NTD News, California. Coming up, Israel moves into a buffer zone with Syria. Victoria Coates, Deputy National Security Advisor during the first Trump administration, joins us to analyze Israel's latest moves following the fall of the Assad regime. French authorities are concerned about around 130 French terrorists in Syria being freed after Assad's fall. Some may return to France via Turkey, posing a security threat. David Vives reports from Paris after the break. Welcome back. If you're just joining us now, here are some of today's top headlines. Luigi Mangioni, the suspect in the killing of the United Healthcare CEO, made his first court appearance in Pennsylvania and was denied bail. Manhattan prosecutors have obtained a warrant for the arrest of Mangione, who's fighting extradition to New York. The Franklin Fire in Malibu, Southern California, has burned over 2,700 acres and is 1% contained. The rapidly spreading fire prompted mandatory evacuation orders and destroyed a number of homes. The New York Attorney General and the Manhattan District Attorney both said they will not dismiss their cases against President-elect Trump just because he's returning to the White House. But the Manhattan DA proposed alternatives such as delaying sentencing until after Trump leaves office or sentencing him to no prison time. The Biden administration said it would recognize and support a new Syrian government given that it renounces terrorism, destroys chemical weapons stockpiles, and protects the rights of minorities and women. Meanwhile, Israel launched airstrikes on Syria and moved its troops into a buffer zone within the country. And joining us now to discuss Israel's latest moves in Syria is Victoria Coates. She served as Deputy National Security Advisor for the Middle East under President Trump and is the Vice President of the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Institute for National Security and Foreign Policy. She is also the author of Battle for the Jewish State, which will be released on December 17th. Victoria, thank you so much for joining us. Good to have you here. Now, in terms of this sterile defense zone Israel's advance aims to achieve, what is the intended goal of this operation to ensure the chemical weapons don't end up in the wrong hands, or how should we read this? No, this is this is a really important action on the part of Israel, and it is obviously the chemical weapons, which are the most dangerous uh, part of the Syrian arsenal, but they're certainly not all of it. 
And so what we're seeing Israel do is is neutralize a whole host of things. It's as if they have a map of the Syrian military and are, they're taking them out. And the other thing they've done, which I think is interesting, is they've taken Mount Hermon, which is the highest point above Damascus. Israel captured that in the 1973 war against Syria. Uh, but then in the in the uh, in the deal that followed that, they gave it back. It's not sacred ground for Israel, but it's the best possible place for keeping an eye on Damascus. Now, we've been seeing Israel and the U.S. launching targeted airstrikes into Syria aimed at weapons stockpiles. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu is saying, quote, we have no intention of interfering in Syria's internal affairs, but we clearly intend to do what is necessary to ensure our security. How do you see these strikes impacting relations with the next Syrian government? No, I think it's very similar to what uh, President Trump said in his uh Truth Social posts over the last couple of days where he said, you know, this isn't the United States' fight. And that's completely consistent with his actions in his first term, in which he said repeatedly, you know, we really don't have a strategic interest in Syria beyond making sure that whatever goes on in Syria doesn't spill into Israel. And so I think that's going to continue to be his approach. And that seems to be what Prime Minister Netanyahu is doing as well. Now, Israel celebrated the fall of the Assad regime, but has been cautious about the rebel faction HTS, given its Islamic roots like al-Qaeda. Netanyahu has said that while Israel wants relations with the new regime in Syria, if Iranian weapons end up passing through Syria to Hezbollah, Israel will, quote, respond forcefully and we will exact a heavy price. How do you see relations between Israel and Syria going forward if it is HTS that becomes the new government? This is this is the issue is no one has any illusions about the Assad regime. I mean, the Assad's ruled Syria for 50 years with an iron fist. They did horrible things. They used chemical weapons repeatedly on their own people. And I remember when President Trump launched airstrikes against them for this in both 2017 and 2018. And then their horrific prisons filled with people who have been tortured for decades. You know, that no, no love lost for the Assads. But the problem, as you point out, is HTS, this group that has taken over, backed by the Turks, have roots in both al-Qaeda and ISIS. They are Islamists. And there are already disturbing reports of churches being shuttered, of women being told they're too free. So I don't think the Trump or the Biden administration rather should be in any hurry to re reverse the special designated terrorist group uh, designation that the Trump administration put on them in 2018. I think that they, the, the HTS should demonstrate their good faith before they're given that concession. And given there are still hostages in Gaza under Hamas, how do you see Syria now fitting into Israel's calculations in the region? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a benefit to Israel because, as you just mentioned, it's going to be much harder for the Iranians to run arms and people through uh, Syria to Lebanon to bolster Hezbollah. So that's probably a, a good thing, a net benefit. Uh, but at the same time, you've got Israel fighting against uh, Hamas in Gaza. We've got had more attacks from the Houthi on commercial shipping on the Red Sea today. And then Iran is also trying to pressure Israel through Jordan and West Bank. And so, you know, there's still a host of fronts uh, that Israel has to cope with. And I think, you know, the the attitude of the Biden administration that they should somehow take a victory lap at this point, you know, isn't actually all that helpful. What Israel needs is robust support from the United States as they try to manage this terrorist threat on top of all the other terrorist, th terrorist threats they face. And Victoria, you have a forthcoming book to be released on December 17th, The Battle for the Jewish State. Talk to us about this battle. Who are the players here? Now, and the important thing here is actually the subtitle, which is how Israel and America can win. And the whole point of the book is that this is not an isolated problem for Israel that they're facing with the October 7th attacks by Hamas on Israel proper. You know, th there we had many, many dozens of Americans killed in that attack. We still have seven Americans held hostage, four we pray are still alive. This was an attack on both of our countries. And so I think it's really important for Americans to understand, you know, why all this has happened, why there's so much anti-Semitism here in the United States. You know, what is the basis of the U.S.-Israel relationship now 76 years old? You know, what are the alternatives? But most importantly, what's next? You know, how do we move forward in the Middle East? How do we treat something like the fall of Assad as an opportunity? How do we get to greater regional cooperation involving the United States and Israel? 
All these things are possible with strong U.S. leadership, uh, but it's going to take some work. Now, you mentioned in the acknowledgments that you had a front row seat to Middle East policy in the Trump administration. What was the most surprising thing you saw from that vantage point? I think it was really the sort of conversion of conventional wisdom going from the, you know, everybody knew there was not going to be a peace deal in the Middle East until there was a Palestinian deal. So we worked really hard for over a year on the so-called deal of, a, of the century, and the Palestinians decided not to engage. And this was deeply disappointing because we'd hoped to make progress. And the surprising thing that happened then is we were approached by a series of Arab nations who said, you know what? We don't want Israel to go away. We're not going to give the Palestinians a veto over our national security policy. We're ready to make peace. And, you know, this just gives you hope and humanity because those peace deals, the Abraham Accords between Israel, UAE, Bahrain, uh, Morocco, those have endured even during this year of war. And so it makes me very hopeful. As I said, it surprised me when it happened, but it makes me very hopeful that uh, in the coming year we might see more of these deals. And Albert Einstein features in your book. Speak to us on why he's such an important figure in this book. No, Albert Einstein, the pioneering physicist who won the Nobel Prize in, in uh, 1913 for the theory of relativity, among, uh, among other things, was then discounted by his own country as a German Jew in the, in the 20s and early 30s. The uh, sort of growing Third Reich uh, scientists tried to, on the one hand, say all Jewish science was false, on the other hand, to say that, they had, that Einstein had stolen it from Third Reich scientists. They couldn't quite get their story straight, but fortunately, you know, Einstein could figure this out and got out. He escaped through Belgium to uh, the United Kingdom and ultimately to the United States. But what's fascinating is he landed at Princeton University, and even then, in the late 30s and 40s, he saw the anti-Semitism that was already growing on U.S. campuses, and he said, you know, we can't suffer the same fate that German ac uh, Jewish academics suffered just trying to assimilate. We have to call this out. We have to call it for the evil that it is. And I think those are prophetic words for us, you know, today to see what's happening on our campuses and make sure we take a very strong stand against it. Victoria Coates, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Around 130 French terrorists jailed in Syria may have been released since the government's collapse. French authorities and Middle East experts say this could potentially pose a threat to France. NTD's international correspondent David Vives reports from Paris. Members of the Syrian community living in France have been celebrating the takeover of the Syrian regime since Sunday. French President Emmanuel Macron and German Chancellor Olaf Scholz said on Tuesday they are ready to work with the new Syrian leaders. However, one issue has raised concerns among French authorities. A group of terrorists who were imprisoned under the al-Assad regime are now likely to be released. The group of French nationals numbers around 200, including women and children. French authorities reported today that dozens of them are thought to have participated in the coup against Assad, with some occupying key positions. Some of the French terrorists jailed in Syria played diverse roles in planning and executing terrorist attacks in France. According to Middle East expert and geopolitician Alexandre Delval, this is a potential threat for the country. The former regime was a horrible dictatorial regime, but it did really arrest dangerous terrorists. So now we have a real security problem. These people can now come back through Turkey because there are now very good links between the new Syrian regime and Turkey. So it's going to be much easier to move through the region. Delval says the Paris attack in 2015 could have been avoided if France and Syria cooperated on security. At the time, Syria hosted terrorist training camps, which is where the attackers who struck Paris were trained. Many EU governments severed ties with Syria during the al-Assad era. I believe it was a mistake to refuse cooperation. Syrian authorities knew where the terrorists came from. Delval also says the situation in Syria should be carefully monitored in relation to international terrorism. However, it is likely that certain individuals in Syria will be tolerated and allowed to undergo ideological or psychological training. While I'm unsure if Julani's movement will entirely prevent terrorist training in Syria, it's probable that it will continue to promote radical Islamist teachings as it did in the past. Some European countries have suspended Syrian asylum claims following the fall of the regime. David Vives, NTD News, Paris.
Coming up, as Shen Yun is gearing up for its 2025 tour, a review of what the art world's elites have shared after watching the show. And in baseball news, Shohei Otani is recovering from injuries on both arms. Will he be ready to play the opener? Dave Martin joins us to discuss after the break. Welcome back. I'm Tiffany Meyer. The classical Chinese dance and music company Shenyun Performing Arts will begin its 2025 world tour just before Christmas. Since its founding in 2006, the company has captivated audiences worldwide, gaining acclaim from the art world's elite. What explains its exceptional success? Here's a glimpse of what professionals had to say after attending the show last year with NTD as a proud media sponsor. It's wonderful. Not only the music, the beautiful orchestra played wonderfully, and the dancing is superb, and the visual effects are, are just striking. I would urge everyone uh, who has uh, the slightest interest in this type of culture, this is a must. I love the show. I thought it was great. The costumes, the music, the dancing, all of the performers are just first rate. Shen Yun showcases classical Chinese dance, which has been refined over thousands of years with profound meaning and extraordinary expressiveness. On the surface, the movements appear to be fleeting, but every still shot of the movement is incredibly beautiful. I noticed that even the slight tap of the finger on the floor results from hours of intense practice. I really wonderful to, to see it coming from their passion of their heart and their soul into the ends of their fingers and it goes right up with their eye line as well so it's really wonderful bringing back a forgotten traditional vocal technique shen Yun singers captivate audiences with performances that are both powerful and deeply moving oh my gosh the baritone my god he filled the whole theater with his voice it was incredible even in Italy, the heart of opera, hearing the Chinese tenor and soprano from Xin Yun was a delightful surprise. In addition, the orchestra's musical accompaniment was fabulous. Bringing to life a lost culture through beautiful art, Xin Yun is not just a visual and auditory feast, it is also a spiritual one. It is a message of peace, serenity, harmony, purity and order. Magnificent, just magnificent. Xin Yun brought culture, Chinese culture, to life through this performance. Definitely a must-see, not to be missed. Xin Yun's 2025 tour will debut on December 23rd in Atlanta, Georgia, and simultaneously in Nagoya, Japan. And now for your sports news, we're joined by NDD's Dave Martin. Dave, a lot going on today, but let's start in college football, where the Heisman Trophy finalists were revealed last night. Could this year be the year a defensive player wins? I mean, it certainly looks like it. You know, Travis Hunter is the odds, odds on choice, so he's actually more of a two way player. That's wide receiver and defensive back. I don't even know which he's better at, though. As a receiver, he was a first team all Big 12 pick, led the conference uh, in catches and touchdowns. As a defensive back, though, he was the Big 12's defensive of the player of the year, so obviously very good at both. Now, no defensive player has won the Heisman since Charles Woodson back in 1997 for Michigan. He was actually a two-way player as well, but more on defense. Now, for this year, though, you also have quarterbacks Cam Ward of Miami, Dylan Gabriel of Oregon, plus you have Boise State running back Ashton Johnson. I mean, you can make a case for all four, of course. I think it's going to be 100, and if it is, it's very well deserved. He had an unbelievable year. Now, this is all going to be announced on Saturday. Well, staying in college sports, there's been an ongoing multi-billion dollar lawsuit that could pave the way for schools to pay their athletes. What's the latest in this case? Well, some of the athletes have actually written to the judge and said they're you know, generally happy with the proposed settlement, but said a players association is needed to protect athletes and prevent you know, some past failures from reoccurring. Now, this proposed settlement is for $2.8 billion. That's going to be distributed over the next 10 years to players of past and present. It would also pave the 
the way for schools to directly pay their athletes, so it's already you know monumental. But it doesn't address this issue they brought up, whether these athletes should be considered employees, which is how this Players Association was exist in the first place. That seems to be a line the NCAA does not want to cross. In any case, they're going to have a hearing to sort out this settlement uh, scheduled for April 7th. So they still have a few months to try to sort this out. Looking at baseball news, Shohei Otani and the Dodgers kick off the season in Japan next March. Is Otani expected to be ready by then? You know, it sounds like Otani, the batter, is going to be ready by then. That's what uh, Dodgers manager Dave Roberts indicated yesterday. Of course, we're still three months away from that. I'm sure the Japanese fans are counting on it. But Otani, he's dealing with a pair of injuries. He hurt his non-pitching shoulder in the World Series. Somehow he still played with it, but he definitely struggled at the plate. Anyway, he had surgery to repair that about a month ago. He also had a surgery on his right elbow. That's his pitching arm. That's in September of 2023. That kept him from pitching all of this year. Now, from what Robert said, there's, they're not expecting Otani, the pitcher, to be ready come next March still. It sounds like they'll kind of bring him along slowly. They want to make sure he's definitely ready for October. So hitting yes, pitching no. Now shifting gears to skiing, women's all-time great Lindsey Vaughn came out of a five-year retirement over the weekend to compete in several events. What has she cited as a reason for returning? You know, she said she recently had a partial knee replacement surgery that helped end the pain. Now, when she retired, this is February 2019, she said her body was, quote, broken beyond repair. Now, she was 34 at the time. Her 82 World Cup race wins, there were more than anyone that's been since passed. But she also had three Olympic medals and eight World Championship medals. Now, after racing over this past weekend, she, are, she says she has enough points now to compete in the World Cup circuit again. So it seems like that is her plan going forward. It almost feels like she's just you know, trying out this like new knee and sees how things going. I mean, she's 40 now. When she retired, uh, she was one of the most decorated skiers ever. Certainly one of the most popular ever. So this is definitely a story we're going to keep following. Well, Dave, as always, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, Tiff. And that's all for today's news. For round the clock coverage, visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Good night. Thank you.